Now I have the privilege. Um, let's get to tonight's keynote speaker, Ms. Dorota Shortel. Dorota has not only been a member of SWE since 1995, but she is also a SWE Life member. And as a SWE Life member, Dorota wants you to consider the following question. Have you wondered what it takes to be a CEO? Or perhaps question if there is a special recipe to be a CEO? Well, Dorota is an engineer who took over as the founder of Simplexity Product Development after working at, with the company as a senior mechanical engineer, project manager, and the director of the Vancouver office. During Dorota's tenure, Simplexity's top line revenue has more than quadrupled and the company has more than tripled in employees. In 2017, Simplexity was selected by Inc. Magazine as one of the best workplaces in America and by the San Diego Business Journal as one of the top fastest growing companies. Droda is also a National Science Foundation Fellow, Tau Beta Pi Fellow, and Institute for the Advanced Engineering Fellow, Advancement of Engineering Fellow. In 2013, she was recognized by the Portland Business Journal as one of the top region's top leaders, business leaders as a 40 under 40 award winner. It is now, I welcome tonight's keynote, Ms. Droda Shortel to the stage. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and thank you, all of you, for having me out here today to speak with you. I am super excited to be able to do this here in Portland because I live in Portland. Yay, Portland! <laughs> I took over for the founder of Simplexity Product Development seven years ago. Those of you who heard my talk uh, from engineer to leader, don't worry, this is not the same talk. <laughs> this is part two. In engineer to leader, I talked about what it took for me to go from an engineering role to the CEO of Simplexity. And now I'm gonna talk about what it means and what it takes to be a CEO. What do you think of when you hear the word CEO? Chief Executive Officer. In your mind, what do you picture? What are the connotations, the positive ones, the negative ones? Who do you picture? My guess is you probably picture one of these top CEOs who are in the news. Elon Musk, Warren Buffett. These are the people that come to mind. How many of you picture yourself when you hear the word CEO? Why not, if you don't? I'm here to challenge you. I'm here to challenge your assumptions and say you should think of yourself when you hear the words CEO. I never thought about being a CEO when I was sitting there in the beginning of my engineering career. Never occurred to me at all. Not one iota. You're going to be ahead of me because it's going to occur to you because I'm going to challenge you and put that thought in your mind that you too one day can be CEO. I mean, the closest I ever came to thinking I would be a CEO is I, I remember in graduate school, one of my friends was saying, this was in the Bay Area, they're going to start do a startup. Everyone was talking about what startup they were going to do, right? And I'm like, I'm not going to do a startup. But then I thought, but maybe one day I'd take over and run a company. I'm pretty organized. That, that was the closest. That was the closest. But not, not CEO. It's so, something that helps organize, right? Now, if you look at the slide here, what do you notice about these CEOs that I've pictured? Lack of diversity, right? For example, there's one woman. This is actually incredibly representative of the number of women CEOs. 
So in Fortune magazine this past year, that lists the 500 CEOs, 32 were women. That's one in 16, like in the previous slide, just over 6%. Now guess what, people were cheering. They said this is the highest number of women CEOs ever on the Fortune 500 list. And now actually it's lower because six of those women have left their positions and many of them are gonna be re uh, replaced by men again. We here at SWE talk about how underrepresented women are in engineering. Well, this is even worse. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. You know, this is something that we, we at SWE, we at local, we can do something about. This is why I'm talking to you here tonight. Because you probably, I didn't think about it, and you probably haven't thought about it, but you should. But don't focus on this statistic. Here's the one I really want you to focus on. So taking the top 100 top performing CEOs, 24 of them have an engineering degree. Is there anyone in this room that has an engineering degree? <laughs> we all know that men and women are equally qualified to be engineers. So 24% of you are equally qualified to be CEO. Why not? The numbers are there. It's only logical. We here, as engineers, have certain skill sets. We have a foundation that we can rely on to become great CEOs. You're already learning that in your career path, especially those of you who've started to do more leadership. This is not some sort of crazy notion, oh, get the CEO out up there, she's going to be the only one. No, there's no reason that I can stand up here and say I'm CEO of an organization and that you can't be. This is my challenge to you and each and every one of you to start picturing yourself and thinking about it. Now, the first time that someone said to me, hey, you should take over and run this organization, I, I said no. And, and uh, I think some of you have heard that before. That's okay, because then once I got to it, I realized I really, really liked it. So now that I'm tasking you, let, let, let's talk about what does it take to be a CEO. And I'm gonna focus on six areas. There's a lot of different skill sets, a lot of different literature that's been written about CEOs. This is based on my personal experience and not just of me, but now that I've been in this role for a number of years, I attend business groups and I interact with other CEOs. So I've gotten to see what are the skills that are needed in this position. And the six I'm gonna focus on today here in this slide, culture, financials, people, negotiation, vision, and execution. And I'll get into details on each and every one of these. All right, let's talk about culture. So as I said, when I took over a CEO, I didn't know if I'd liked it. I liked engineering. No problem. <laughs> I can just cue you and it'll be fine. I liked engineering. And what I liked about engineering was the creative process. I enjoyed being able to design and create a product. I, I enjoyed being able to see something that I created out in the market. That was really exciting to me. And what I realized as I got into the job actually pretty quickly that I was applying that exact same creative process but instead of designing a product I was designing a company. I was designing an organization. And for me Culture is so key. So let's talk about culture. What does culture mean, right? Culture, there's written parts of culture like the values, for example, and I know some other speakers today uh, and yesterday talked about values. So at Simplexity, we have four core values, and those values are integrity, employee well-being, client success, and product development excellence. And if you're in my organization, you know that because I've created a whole awards program about celebrating when people live those values. Those are really important. 
And <coughs> culture is defined by that. And, th and there's many, every organization has the, has the values and they have it written down. And the question though is, when, how does it become part of culture? Culture is not just what you write down. Culture is the heart, it's the personality of an organization. It's the written, it's the unwritten rules, it's the behavior. And as a CEO and someone at the top of an organization, it's your responsibility and your privilege to get to shape that culture. So think about where you work. What are the parts of culture that you really like? Now what are the parts of the culture that you don't like? Now imagine that you're now CEO of your organization. You get to fix that. You get to affect that. You get to create change. You get to make this world through your organization the type of place that you want to work and that people like you want to work. Just like we choose our friends based on personality fit, we choose our organizations based on culture fit. So for me, I, I asked my employees, I said, what is the most important thing about our culture that you value? And I got a lot of great responses and a lot of great stories back. And the number one theme that came up most often was the word flexibility. And I love that, I love that. And this is why I loved it. Because when I was an engineer, I had the privilege of being able to have some flexibility in my work and my life. I, had, I have two children, they're a little bit older now, but when they were real little, I had the flexibility to work from home, to work part time, and I really valued that. And so when I became the CEO, I said, I'm going to embrace that and I'm going to amp it up even more so. So there was a story that one of my employees shared saying, you know, as a single parent, the flexible work schedule has been one of the most important things for me because I'm able to take my daughter to doctor's appointments and to dentist appointments and to martial arts classes and one month grandma was in the hospital for three days. We were able to visit grandma was able to take my daughter there. And the comment was, I have no idea how other single parents do this without having an organization that's that flexible. The thing to note is this was a male engineer. <coughs> this was not a female engineer. Flexibility is important for me and the women who have kids. Yes, absolutely. But I'm taking it to the next level. I want flexibility for men as well as for women. I want flexibility when your family needs you there. But then what if you don't have family needs and you're working really hard? So for me, I have high expectations. Everyone will tell you that. I want people to excel. But I want them to do that in the way that they can. So as long as they are meeting their goals and meeting the client needs and being there for their team, and having excellent performance, I don't care when they work. They don't have to ask for permission because I trust them and they trust the organization. So yes, if someone's got a kid and they've got a school performance, absolutely go, go to your school performance. Just, just make sure you let your team know. You don't want to let people down. But at the same time, I've got young, single employees, engineers who don't have family commitments and why should they have to be there from eight to five when other people don't? It's beautiful, here, here in Portland, it's beautiful sometimes, right? It's raining a lot of times. And on that one day when you know, Tuesday it's beautiful and sunny and the rest of the week and the whole weekend it's gonna rain, I don't want people to pretend they're sick and call in sick. <laughs> I want them to go rock climbing and send me pictures and say, this is what I did on a Tuesday, and yeah, I'll make up the work in the evening or the weekend. As long as you don't have meetings or commitments, go for it. Enjoy life. You don't want to wait till you retire. That's what I value. That's the organization I'm creating. Now, you might have completely different values. Values aren't right or wrong. I'm able to create that because I'm putting myself out there 
and creating the environment I want people to work in. Now, you might have other values that you're thinking, man, wouldn't that be cool? Well, guess what? You may one day have that opportunity to create an organization and to live those values and to give other people that opportunity through you. All right, culture. Culture is my favorite, but we got to talk about financials. So, like it or not, CEOs are judged by the financial performance of the company. The statistics I give you, uh, gave you of the top 100 performing CEOs was not based on their culture, although it does affect the financials. And I had a whole talk about how culture affects the financials of your organization, because it does. But they're graded by the financial performance. So let's talk a little bit about money and financials. The only formal money-related class I had in school was engineering economics. Any of you had to take that when you had to do your FEEIT exam? That's it. That's the only one I had. I don't have an MBA. I have a, under, a bachelor's and a master's in engineering. So I get placed into this CEO role. And one of the, the, the points I'm, I like to make is you don't have to know everything before you take the job. You just have to know how to learn and how you're going to get there. So I didn't really know much about financials, but you know, I'm smart. I'll figure it out. So what I did is I learned from other people. I got books, and I got to the point where at least I understood what financial statements are. And then you have a good team. You're not doing it all by yourself. That helps you understand this. And, and some of this stuff is pretty common sense. And as engineers, we're good at math, so we can figure out accounting, even though double bookkeeping is kind of a weird thing. One of the things, though, that you have to realize is there's a few things that are a little bit odd and that don't necessarily come as second nature. And one of these things uh, is the story about cash. So there's a difference between profit and cash. Profit is how much money you're generating. So a few years ago, our company was growing really fast. You, saw, you heard some of the st statistics. So we were growing 60% in one year. We were doing awesome. So clients are hiring us. We're doing cool engineering projects. We're hiring engineers. We're going, we're going. But the thing is, is we pay our engineers, what, every two weeks? That's usually how often you get paid. But when do clients pay us? Well, they pay us after the work is done and not immediately, like 30, 60, hopefully not longer days. So when a company grows really fast, even if you're profitable, your profits are going you know, through the roof, you have to worry about cash, meaning how are you going to pay people before you get paid? And this is even more pronounced in a company that does products, not we're doing design engineering services, right? How are you going to pay people? And so what we had to do is we have a line of credit, and we, we as the owners actually had to loan the company money at one point in time so we could make payroll. The company was profitable, was doing great, but you have to make those decisions and figure out how you're going to do that. We're a small business. We're not venture-backed. We're all, all the way that we've funded our growth is through the money coming into the company and through having a bank and, and debt. So let's, let's talk about some parallels here. You're, most of you here are engineers. How many of you, as uh, you know, most of you who probably have credit cards, how many of you, show of hands here, pay their credit card full balance off every single month? At least half, maybe 60%? So you've got an advantage here as, an, as, a, as a fiscally responsible engineer because you, ah, Slide. <laughs> there we go. Most of you are ahead of the general population. So only about 35% of the general, general population pays off their credit cards every month. So as an engineer, you're already fiscally responsible. You're already thinking about how to save. And most of the engineers I know, not all, are pretty good at that. And as a leader of a company, 
you have to be pretty good at that. So you know, there's the stories of the people who got millions of dollars in venture funding, and they just went hog wild. They rented huge, expensive office suites with ping pong tables and and uh, personal masseuses, and buying you know gold rimmed sunglasses with their logos on it, and they ran out of money. Right? That's that's not us. We don't do that. Not most of us. Actually, the thing that I had to learn more so was the other side of it, the risk side of it, that I couldn't be financially and fiscally conservative like I am in my personal finances, that it was OK to take on debt, that it was OK to max out half a million dollars, uh, ha sorry, half a million dollars of a line of credit for growth reasons as long as it was for the right reasons. This is not something that made me personally comfortable to do. I don't like debt. I like to pay stuff off. <laughs> but had I not taken on debt, the company couldn't grow. So that's one of those financial things that you have to stretch yourself a little bit to think about, well, how do you grow a company? And what do you do? And I'm really happy we've paid off all the debt. We stopped growing so fast. We're still now growing faster, so we might be at that point again. But as long as you're doing it for the right reasons, debt is good. It can help. So the third area I want to talk about is finding the right people. Hiring and firing. And building a team. I can say that the reason that Simplexity has been as successful as it has been is because of the people. We have done a great job finding the right talent and being able to create that organization. How many of you in this room have hired people before? What about 20% maybe? 10, 20%? How many of you uh, have served on an interview team that affected the hiring decisions? About half of you. I recommend you do that because that helps get you that training and also makes you think about who do you want to be on, on your team and how do you want to do that. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the other side of that, the firing. That usually doesn't get talked about because it's not a comfortable topic. How many of you have had to fire somebody before? Just a handful, five or six. So let's talk about that. Because very many people won't talk about it. But as a CEO and as a leader of an organization, you have to think about that. So the case for firing someone when they've done something horrible like stolen money from the company, OK, that's hard, but that's justified. Here's what's really hard. The case when you have to fire someone who's a good person. The case when it's just not the right fit or they're not able to perform the job, that's brutal. A few years ago, we had a very difficult time financially. We didn't have enough work to support the people we have, and companies go through those cycles. I pulled everybody together and explained what the situation was, because I believe in transparency and communication. And for as long as we could, financially, we job shared and reduced hours and reduced costs to not have to fire or lay anyone off. And then there came the time when it was inevitable. It was a point where I knew that if we didn't lay at least some of the people off, the whole company would go under. That was the worst decision I've ever had to make. Because they were good people. And I knew I had to do that. It was one of the few times that after making that decision, I went home and I cried. Because I felt like a failure. I felt like I had let every single one of those individuals down. And I share this because I don't want to mislead you that it's all fun and games. It's not. But if you do that with dignity and respect, 
you can get through that too. I'm happy to say we were able to rehire a number of those people. Still tough. But the thing that makes you a good leader is being able to do the difficult things when you know you have to. So as a corollary, maybe this will help a little bit in perspective. How many of you have ever had to break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend? Was it fun? <laughs> Not usually. <laughs> Was it the right thing to do? Yeah, in retrospect, probably. <laughs> and if you've had the courage to have those difficult conversations, instead of just texting someone, <laughs> then you've actually had some experience that you can relate. And it's the people that have that emotional intelligence and maturity that are able to take on the roles that have the responsibility and the opportunity because it's not just fun and games. And when it is, you figure out a way to do it with as much dignity as you possibly can. All right. Let's stop wiping the tears from our eyes here and talk about <laughs> something a little bit more positive. I promise that was the most depressing part of the talk. We're, we're all going uphill now. <laughs> so the next area I want to talk about is negotiation. So here at We Local, we had some great sessions about negotiation. I attended one of them yesterday. I know there's a couple others. And the negotiation piece that was talked about was personal kind of negotiation, negotiating for your salary and so forth, which is important. So negotiation is important no matter where you are in your career or even if you're still a student. There's no point, no point in time where negotiation is not important. So these are skills that are always, always, always good to develop. It'll never hurt you to be a better negotiator. But what I have to learn now, had to learn once I got in this role was not negotiating for myself, but negotiating for my company. And again, this was another opportunity that I had to make a stronger company by the deals that I could negotiate for the company. So I'll give you an example, and unfortunately I can't kind of share all the details because it's actually a confidential example, so I'll, I'll play around a little bit with it to try to give you the gist of it. So there was a, there was a deal I was uh, negotiating with a potential client and I actually brought in a negotiation expert to help me and to, to help coach me. So rather than just handing off the negotiation, I wanted to learn and, and learn to be better. And the first offer on the table wasn't a very good one. And so here's the mistake that most people make and that I made and that I've learned about negotiation. In order to be a good negotiator, you have to be okay with disharmony and conflict. I love harmony. I want everyone to get along. That's, that's my perfect world. Yay, everyone, let's get along. With negotiation, you can't do that because you'll take a bad deal just to make everyone get along. So I had to learn to be OK with disharmony, <coughs> with uncomfortable silence. How are you doing with that? <laughs> People like to fill silence, and they'll fill it with a bad offer. I had to be OK with time and using time to get a better deal, to understand the other side's position and what their best alternative was to a negotiated agreement. And in that negotiation, I realized that us as a leadership team, we wanted to just take a deal and be done with it, right? We wanted to get moving on it. And we realized that, that actually the other party, they needed to be done with it faster and it was more important for them. 
And so what we did is we waited. And that was hard. I like to get stuff done. I like to have a resolution. But by waiting weeks, not days, we got a much better deal on the table. And the true value of a good negotiation is creating a win-win. So it's not a haggling, I give you this much, this much, like, kind of like at the flea market, it's not haggling. It's what's the value that you are bringing to the table? What's the value they are bringing? How can you mesh those? How do you create a creative solution that works best for both parties? Engineering again here, creative solutions, right? It's not just money. It's what else can you bring to it? And what was really amazing about going through that experience of negotiating for my company, and again, being coached by one of the experts in this, was A, the deal was tens of thousands of hi higher than it would have been had we you know, just kind of compromised on the first deal, and B, the relationship between our company and their company was stronger because of it. And that I did not expect. So negotiation, again, for yourself is one thing, but for the company, it's now affecting, for me, 75 plus different people. And so it's really important for me to get good at this negotiation. There we go. All right, we got two more areas here. Vision and execution. So vision, is figuring out where you want to go, whether it's your personal vision or for your company. And execution is figuring out a plan to actually get you there. So as an example, I want you guys to think back on your last few vacations. Got your last few vacations? How many of you, raise your hand, if you came up with the idea of where to go on vacation? All right, maybe 40% of you. Now, how many of you came up with the detailed plan, booked the tickets, all the hotels, and hour by hour you knew exactly where you were gonna go? <coughs> A few more of you. So one is vision, you can figure out which one. One's execution. Some people are naturally better at one, some are naturally better at the other, and some are good at both. And you do need both. But you don't have to be good at both you personally, because you know what, if you're going on vacation with someone else, someone else, could, one person can do the vision, the other can do the execution. Same in the company, right? You don't have to be good at everything, as long as you have other people that are good at it. So let's talk about complexities vision as an example. So when I took over the company uh, seven years ago, as, uh, as mentioned, it was a pretty small. It had uh, two offices in San Diego and one here in the Portland area across the river in Vancouver, Washington. And I you know, started to evolve the company and think about what we wanted to do and what we wanted to be. And at that time, we're a pretty general engineering design services company. We'll design stuff for anyone that wants stuff designed. It was about that well-defined. And as we started to think about, well, what are our strengths? What's my vision for this organization? What can we be? And this was a group process. It's not just me. Started to think about what can we, how can we distinguish ourselves in the marketplace? What are we uniquely qualified to do that others don't do as well? And we realized that Mechatronics, and a lot of you who are engineers know that word, but that intersection between mechanical, electrical, computer engineering, and control systems was a real skill and an asset, and doing that especially for higher volume design of products. So our vision, the vision that we have, that we helped craft for our organization, is to be the mechatronics design engineering leader on the West Coast. We wrote it down, share that with the company, that's where we're going. And so what, what, how did having that vision help us? So here's an example of how it helped us. Uh, last year, about almost around this time, maybe a little bit later, it was the end of April, uh, there was a similar uh, kind of a competitor design engineering firm in Seattle that went out of business. Very sudden. And knowing that our vision was to be the mechatronics leader on the West Coast, it was actually a fairly quick decision to say, hey, Seattle's on the West Coast. And we had just opened 
an office in the Bay Area. And even though it was financially a little bit taxing to open another new location, we knew this opportunity wasn't going to come around very often. And so based on that vision, I said, all right, it's going to be painful because we've just invested all this money in opening a Bay Area office, but we're going to do it. We're going to open that Seattle office. And we did. And it's been very successful. And it's now up to 12 people. But yet someone else came to me and said, well, do you want to open an office in Montana? And they did. I actually did get that email. And I said, no, not now, not in, not in my current vision. It's a lot harder to say no than to say yes. And as engineers, we have a lot of great ideas, and we like to do them. So as another example, we said, well, the, the markets that we work on, in are biotech and consumer devices, electromechanical systems, so designing 3D printers, designing DNA sequencing machines. These are the markets we want to work in. And sometimes there's clients that come to us, potential clients, that have really cool engineering projects, but they're not in those markets and they're not in mechatronics. And having that vision gives us the discipline to say no to money coming in in the form of projects, which is hard. It creates alignment about where we're going as an organization. And then the last part of this, the, last, uh, the sixth area I'm going to talk about is the execution piece. And a number of you raised your hands that are good at execution. I love execution. I am a detail-oriented planner, and I like to put together a plan and make it happen. So how do I then execute on this vision that I've helped create for the company? One of the things that you know, I do is I set here's where we're going. And then I take the executive management team and the directors of the different department areas, and we figure out, well, who's going to do what to meet that vision? So for example, marketing's got to help define what mechatronics means and create blog posts about it and videos so people understand what that is. And sales has to approach the right type of clients in the target markets so that we grow in the direction we want to grow. And engineering, well, engineering is we've got to train the engineers and have the right tools so we can execute on the type of projects we want to do. When recruiting in HR, well, we've got to find the right type of engineers that have the expertise in the markets in the area that we want to do. And well, the production manager and the prototyping people, well, we have to make sure that we can make the parts. So it all aligns. And we have, an, we, I like to do stuff on the cloud, so we have an initiative dashboard where everyone's got what are they going to get done and how are they going to do it to get to the vision, and how are we going to follow that plan so we can actually do what we think we want to do. So that's that execution piece, is to follow through and actually create the plan and make sure it gets done. And, and for me as the CEO, I have two important roles in that. One is make sure we have a plan. And the second one is accountability is making sure that people are accountable to themselves to do what they say they do. And if they're not, then I get the fun job of making sure that I'm keeping them accountable and say, hey, this was due. Where is it? This type of planning is probably fairly natural to a number of you. And for those of you that it isn't, it's something you can learn, or it's something that you can hire someone who is good at it. All right, so in summary here, got six areas I've talked about. Now, if you only remember one thing from what I'm going to tell you, it's this. I want you <coughs> to get better at the one or two areas that you're the best in, the one you're already good in. I don't want you to look at this list and say, what's the worst area I'm in? And I'll work on that, because maybe I'll get to average. Maybe I'll be mediocre in that. Being average in all six areas is not going to set you apart. The CEOs that I know are not excellent in every one of these six areas. 
but they are excellent in a few of them. And they've risen above because they get really good at one of these areas. Now your company has to be excellent in all these areas, but you're, I'm not creating a one-person company. You're hiring, remember point number three here with people, you're hiring people. You're gonna hire the people that are excellent. So where can you be excellent? So now I want you to think, and you don't have anything to write with, but I want you to mentally write down what is the area that when I was describing, you felt pretty comfortable about like, yeah, I got that down. Yeah, I know that one. Like, I'm, I'm not really, uh, that's not a stretch for me. I, I'm pretty good at that. Or what is the area that you think I can get really good at? Pick one, at least one, have one mentally noted in your, in your mind, maybe even up to two, three, Probably four is about the most I want you to, but, but think of at least, at least one and a few. Which are the ones you're good at? All right, you got it? Need more time? Thumbs up, yeah? How many of you picked culture? Show of hands. All right. Now, of those the hands that are up, Stand up if you're actually willing to do something about it. You, right there. Stand up. Keep standing up. But I saw you stand up first. What's your name? April Mills. April. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, April, you're on the other keynote for at lunch, right? Have you read this book? Simon Sinek's Leaders Eat Last. All right, who's the second person that stood up? <laughs> who, uh, who, who, what's your name? Joanna. Joanna, have you read this book? No, can I read it? Yes. <laughs> this is a gift. <laughs> Joanna is going to become our culture guru. She is going to excel. She is going to be awesome at creating culture. And that's just the beginning of the books you're going to read. That's number one. You're going to find all the books on culture, and you're going to be a rock star on culture. All right. Number two, financials. How many of you, when I was talking about financials, said, yeah, that's an area that I actually would be interested in? Less? All right. Now, <laughs> Who, who wants to actually learn more about financials, especially if you're a manager? Stand up. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Back there, who, what's that? Really you're just short, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You guys get to fight over this. Who has not read Finance for Managers? Have you read it? No. All right, come on up. <laughs> Short's gotta win every once in a while. What's your name? What's that? Savannah. Savannah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. All right, finance for managers. This, some of you might consider very dry, but not Savannah, because Savannah yes. is going to be our awesome finance person. And when you need to hire someone for your company because you don't want to do finance, this is who you're going to hire. All right, people. So those of you that raised their hands very tentatively when I said, talked about breakups, and you're like, I can't believe she's talking about breakups in a sweet conference. Those of you who said, I can, I'm good at people and I can do both sides, raise, raise your hands. All right, great. Now, who's willing to have those difficult conversations? <laughs> Ooh, a lot of you, I love it. All right, you stood up here first. Remind me your name again? Nicole. Nicole. This is the book for you. Fierce Conversations. Have you read this book? I have not. You need to read this book. This, I've read this book, and this one tells you the language you need to know to have both good and bad conversations. And don't worry, for those of you that want to uh, know these books, I'll, I'll have a handout at the end with them so you don't have to jot them down on your phone or anything. All right, you are going to be our fierce conversator. Thanks so much. <laughs> Negotiation, who likes to negotiate? <laughs> now, this is a classic. 
So stand up if you have not read Getting to Yes. All right, you guys tell me who stood up first. I was not paying attention. All right, over here, what's your name? Anna. Anna. You are going to become a negotiation guru. People are going to be so afraid to go against the table with you, Anna, because they're going to be like, oh my gosh, she is such a good negotiator. But then they're going to love it because you're going to create these win-win relationships. So here you go, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> All right, those of you who said, I'm the idea person and the vision and the strategy, oh yeah, we got a lot of you. And those of you who <laughs> I'm going to start having to do an interview or something. All right. <laughs> Those of you who care about strategy and vision and want to learn what good and bad strategy is. All right. Man, there's a lot of you. All right. You can, you can also buy these books. They are available in the bookstore. <laughs> Come on up. What's your name? Alexis. Alexis. Sorry, did I miss you here in front? Okay. <laughs> Alexis. All right. So Alexis is gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be a, our vision person. You're gonna figure out where we're going and you're gonna figure out the good strategy part and not the bad strategy part, all right? Thank you. Okay. All right, who's got a better idea of how to hand out this book? Because I bet a number of you are good at execution. Yeah. <laughs> Rock, paper, scissors, do you have to, how's this? Pick a number. Whoever can come up here and tell me a good execution and planning story gets my favorite book on execution. How much time do we have? <laughs> Not enough time. All right. Whoever can run up here the fastest. <laughs> Stage diving. Okay. You guys, you guys get to fight over this book afterwards. You can rip it in half. What's your name? Hannah. Hannah. I like your zeal. Four disciplines of execution. Yes. Uh, we have handouts with all of these books, plus an extra one for each category. So two of my favorite books in each category, you will be getting those. So if you didn't quite make it to get a book, <laughs> you get to now buy or rent, there are libraries, most of them are in the library, and read those books. All right, my final thoughts here. There is a statistic that it takes women being asked seven times to accept a leadership position. Seven times. I actually, I didn't count, but I, I was actually asked to take over a CEO a year before I did. So I, I live this. I'm not gonna talk about the reasons why, because it doesn't matter. The point is, <laughs> Consider this ask number one. I am asking each of you to consider rising to the occasion of being the top leader in your organization. I am asking you because we as SWE, we as 24% of engineers can do it, but only if we rise to the occasion. And when you do, because I know some of you will, contact me. My contact information's on the sheet I just handed out. And we'll go out and we'll celebrate the opportunities that you have created. And I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dorota, for your remarks.
Uh, we do have a few moments, so who would like to be the first question? All right, you said that you, the first time you were asked, you said no. So what changed your mind, or what was the, the moment? The reason I said no was uh, I was still working part-time, and my daughter was in preschool. And I knew that taking over an organization would require me to work full-time, and I didn't want to do it. And so when uh, my daughter went to kindergarten, the founder went, came, asked me again, and said, she's in kindergarten, full-day kindergarten. <laughs> So I said yes, but I wasn't sure still, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to try it. I mean, what's the worst that can happen, right? You just ruin the whole organization. <laughs> that's, that's what shifted, yeah. Time and willing to, willing to try it, so. Hi, Dorota, this is Stephanie from Columbia River. Thank you for doing this. Um, sure. I um, thank you for sharing the most difficult decision that you had to make too. Um, I think we really appreciate um, you sharing that with us. I'm just wondering, what do you consider to be the most rewarding side of being a CEO so far? The most rewarding side of the CEO? Uh, I think crafting that culture is, is really number one for me. But the other side that I like is, since it's an engineering organization that I'm working in, it's really fun to see a team being able to design really cool products that work and then having clients complement our engineers. I love that. I love it. We actually have you know, this kind of unsolicited compliment thing that I do. When someone comes up and says, oh my gosh, this engineer just rocked it and they were awesome. I, that's, I live for that. I, I love when people on my team can be successful. It makes, it makes, me, it makes me successful. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's my favorite. Coral Jean, I think, back right there. I'm getting in my steps. Number seven having a thick skin. Oh yeah, you 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 have to be able to take some punches, right? Not everyone's going to be happy with you. It's sort of I equate a little bit to parenting in in some ways, right? Sometimes I have to do things my kids aren't real happy with me about, but it's good for them. Now it's not quite the same relationship. You're not a parent of your employees. But sometimes you make decisions and not everyone is happy with them. So you just kind of suck it up and move on and you try to make the best decision you can. Yeah. Question here, over there. Hi, my name is Megan. So I was, I've been kind of going around and the big question I've been asking everybody is a lot of us are graduating seniors or are in college moving into the um, working world, what is something that you wish you would have known going into the working world that you could tell your 21, 22 year old self? What I had wished, let's see, one of the things I learned, um, it's actually probably I would have told my 19 year old self while I was still in school was to pay more attention to writing classes. <laughs> Uh, engineering is really good, but you have to be a good writer and communicator, so that, that's one of the things that I always try to tell people still in school is, is the engineers that have an engineering education, you know, you're at a certain level, but the ones that can also communicate and write are the ones that, that rise above. Um, the other part of the career, I guess, when I was starting my career, um, I didn't write written goals. I do it now, and I've started, I've been, I've, since I took over our, uh, as CEO, I've joined some business groups and other CEO groups, and we have a discipline of writing written goals. Uh, and sometimes I'd write goals, but I was not really good at it. Uh, it's really, it really does help. It's not just a lie that they, they, they make up to say write your goals down. Because I, now that I write my goals down, and I've done this for four or five years now pretty religiously, and then I have people follow up on to make sure I, I meet those goals, I've, I've accomplished a lot more. And had I done that when I was 22 and said, here's my goal, I kind of had unwritten goals. I even told my manager I wanted to be project manager, I want to do this, but I never actually like sat down and wrote professional and personal goals. Um, it is a good practice. It's, it's maybe doesn't feel as natural for some people, and it, I didn't really think about it. But now that I do it and I write down uh, you know, top three business goals and top three personal goals every year, and then I make sure I, I do something about them. It's, it's made me, for example, work out regularly. It's made me figure out where the company should go. 
Uh, it's made me a better public speaker. That was one of my goals about four years ago. Hi, my name is Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Um, I was wondering, so being a CEO, it seems more like a job with people versus like technology or mm -hmm. um, manufacturing or whichever engineering mm -hmm. discipline you're into. So uh, what's the difference between what you were doing at first and now, and how do you like it in comparison to kind of being the grunt work? It's a good question. I like both, to be honest. And if you hate people and hate being around people, you probably shouldn't be CEO. So that's why it's not 100% of you are going to be CEO. Um, I like what I really liked about engineering was doing CAD. I loved CAD. Oh my gosh, it was like Christmas, right? I loved creating stuff and getting the parts back and putting them together and seeing how they work. Um, so, do I miss it a little bit? I do, but I get a lot of job satisfaction from creating organizations and other things that it, I don't like pine for it or anything. I mean, I still fix stuff around the house. Um, and I still get to see what the other engineers are doing. But if you love that, and if you never want to do anything but that, then yeah, be an ex excellent technical leader, and there's technical tracks and so forth. So it's, it's not for everyone, but it's, a lot, it's for a lot more of you than you think. See, so we have time for one more. Hi, so um, I understand that running a company with a lot of people, you have to see over, uh, you have to oversee everything that goes on. What happens when you have things that get out of control that aren't in your control? How do you deal with that? How do you overcome with that? How do I deal with things out of my control that are out of control? Oh, I don't like that because I'm a control freak. I've had to let go. <laughs> It's hard. That's one of the hardest things for me is I like things in control. I don't know if you guys get that sense. Um, it's hard for me to delegate, but you have to do it. And one of the things that I have to do now is I'm a, I do a lot more coaching than I used to, than I ever really thought I'd have to do. So instead of uh, being the manager of a particular engineer, if there's something that goes wrong, I can't go and talk to that engineer directly because that's undermining their man the manager, right, who's doing that job. So my role is more of a coach to coach the managers to help them with the problems so they can solve them. Uh, one of the uh, speakers I've heard in the past t says that as a leader, you need to ask 20 times more questions than give answers. That's a hard one, especially as engineers. We like to give answers. But asking the questions and letting others figure out how to do stuff creates an organization that can grow because if all the answers have to come to my desk, you know, how much can I handle in a day? I'd be overloaded. And so you have to be okay with other people making mistakes and things being out of control, giving them that leeway and not just yelling at them, but coaching them and saying, well, how are we going to do this better next time? All right. Thanks. Thank you, Dorota, for being our We Achieve Ceremony keynote speaker. As a token of our appreciation, please accept this gift. Thank you.